You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Uh, A little housekeeping thing before we get started. Surpassed 20,000 downloads for the month of June uh, all over Virginia and Maryland. That is a huge thing. And really thank you guys for making me actually ranked nationally in the Wilderness Podcast section. I really appreciate that. Um, And so I really wanted to celebrate without further ado, getting somebody in here to really talk about the ecosystem, how it's all connected. We all talk about maybe the New River, the James, the Potomac, the Susquehanna, all these rivers, but all these rivers feed into the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And that's kind of like the main heart. And so the guy that I got on here uh, is, is Marty, the executive secretary of the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Um, and we got a lot of topics to go over today. Um, this is going to be an exciting conversation. And thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule to come on the show. Well, thank you, Thomas, uh, for allowing me to have come on the show and, and, and delighted to share whatever knowledge I have for you and your listeners. So really, for people that don't know or are not aware of this organization, what is the Potomac River Fishery Commission? Yeah, it's a really interesting history um, if you go to try to check it out. Um, The agency's actually been around for quite a while. Um, It was created in 1963. Um, The enabling legislation that created our agency was a bi-state compact between Maryland and Virginia. John F. Kennedy signed the enabling legislation in 62 before he was assassinated. And we had our first meeting in January of 63. And I'm only the third person to run this agency since 1963. That's Um, insane. Yeah, it's really crazy. Um, But the genesis for this agency, because I think most of your listeners will recognize that the Potomac River is owned by the state of Maryland to the to the far shore or what we call the mean low water mark. Um, In in our case, for our jurisdiction, um, to the mean low watermark for for Virginia, and our jurisdiction starts at the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, which demarcates the District of Columbia from uh, the downstream waters of the Potomac. So Maryland owns that water downstream of all of the Potomac, um, except for the D.C. portion. but in, in the late 50s, there was a lot of conflict over oysters, and a lot of you probably have read about the oyster wars. And in this particular case, um, there was some poaching going on in the late 50s, 1958 to be specific. There was a specific incident where some Virginia watermen were out poaching oysters using a dredge, which was illegal gear. Um, and the Maryland Oyster Navy, which is the precursor of the modern day natural resources police, came up on these folks and uh, tried to apprehend them. They made a run for it. And a young officer with the uh, Oyster Navy fired a shot. It was uh, poor visibility. He thought he was shooting up in the air and he hit a young 26 year old Virginian uh, in the chest Hmm. and killed him. His name was Berkeley Muse. And um, Berkeley left three kids fatherless. And the two governors of the two states got together the next day uh, and said, nobody else is going to get killed over an oyster any, ever. So they formed the agency that I now run, the Potomac River Fisheries Commission, to co-manage the river with equal representation from Virginia and Maryland. So the governor of Virginia appoints four commissioners and the governor of Maryland appoints four commissioners. And these eight commissioners get together four times a year to manage that stretch of the river from the Woodrow Wilson Bridge down to where the Potomac meets the Chesapeake. It's about 100 nautical miles of distance. And over that space, as as you and probably a lot of your listeners know, the fisheries are pretty diverse. You know, they they range from brackish with, you know, really good largemouth bass fishing um, and and other species, uh, you know, up by the Wilson Bridge. When you get down to the lower part of the river, you could be fishing for Spanish mackerel, red drum. There could be any number of things down there, even cobia, uh, striped bass are present throughout the river. Um, And then we have oysters and crabs, depending on the salinity. You know, oysters primarily below the 301 bridge Hmm. um, and crabs can wax and wane up the river, you know, with salinity. So there's a lot of resources, very diverse. Uh, The habitat's very diverse. The riverine conditions are very dynamic. They change all the time. Um, So it's a really challenging ecosystem to manage. 
but there's a lot going on there and, and it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, and we work with our partners in Maryland and Virginia on a number of uh, Bay related issues. Um, so uh, anyway, I'm trying try to, to tie it together in a nutshell. It, this little agency is not well known, but it's been around a long time. And, um, you know, we're, you know, we, uh, we have a lot going on here. That's what I really love about doing this long form conversation is I would never have guessed with a thousand guesses. It was over a shooting for oysters that this was mm-hmm. done. That is insane. Mm-hmm. And, and just to make sure that I, I heard it correctly. So there's eight individuals that are elected. How many individuals work with underneath of you, or is it just eight in the whole organization? Yeah. So the eight commissioners um, are appointees by the governors and they're my bosses. So I okay. answer them. Yeah. So, so I'm the executive director for lack of a better term here. They call it the exec- executive secretary because I don't technically direct. Um, the decision makers at our commission are these eight appointed commissioners and they change. Um, I've been here almost a decade now. As of July 1st, I've been here 10 years. Previously, I worked for almost three decades at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources in their fishery service. So I've been around a long time. Um, But I work for these eight commissioners. They get together quarterly and we make decisions to set seasons on striped bass and other species and whatever, uh, oysters, crabbing. Um, And then under me, I have a small staff of four others. So uh, we, I have another scientific technical person that, is, that assists me um, and then three administrative folks. So we're very, very small, um, but have a lot of ground to, to, to cover. Um, and, and it's pretty challenging, but also pretty rewarding. Yeah, that's a major area that you have to cover with not as many people as you probably would like to have. That's, mm-hmm. that's insane. And, and being this all started with oysters, when did the striped bass and the striped bass issues that we face today, when did that become an important part of what you guys do? Yeah, I would say when when PRFC joined the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, I think that's really when PRFC became very relevant with striped bass. Um, and that would have been in, in, in parallel to the Striped Bass Emergency Act, which was passed, I believe, in 1984. And so that was right before the moratorium was implemented by the state of Maryland, and later it was implemented by PRFC. And Virginia, and I can't remember who else enacted that. But I guess going to answer your question, Thomas, it would be the mid 80s. It was at that time we joined the Potomac, I mean, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So recall that um, a lot of the decisions that are made on a coastal basis for for many species, including striped bass, have to be um, approved at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, uh, which has been around since 1941. And then that's a Uh, a commission made up of the states along the Atlantic seaboard from Maine to Florida. Um, So so they're all states. It's the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. PRFC is not a state. Um, But at some point, PRFC came in, I believe it was 84 with the Striped Bass Act. And then the District of Columbia has a seat. Um, So that's another state. And then the National Marine Fisheries Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are also voting members there. So with striped bass, we became relevant, I believe, in the mid 80s, about the time the moratorium started with the Striped Bass Act. And uh, since then, we've been a voting member on everything. And then uh, currently, I'm the chairman of the Atlantic Striped Bass Management Board. So um, I'm thinking I'm the first PRFC uh, director to uh, to hold that seat. And it's a prestigious uh, seat and it's a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of challenge with that. But um uh, you know, I welcome it and, and, and I'm very blessed for the opportunity. So we've got a lot of things going on and I'm very directly involved in it. Did, did this happen in parallel with the Clean Water Acts or was that later on in the 90s that the Clean Water Acts really got going? My understanding of the Clean Water Act, and it isn't real good, I don't have a great depth of knowledge of it, but my understanding- Neither do I. <laughs> Yeah, that started, I want to say, back in, the, in like 72. Okay. And the reason I say that is- you know, the Potomac was pretty much a mess. Um, talking to my predecessor and looking at the records here, talking to folks that worked in the Potomac before I came along, um, the water quality was absolutely awful back in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, people look now and they, they you know, they're, they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, the state of the Bay, the state of the Potomac is it's such a mess. Um, and sure, our water quality certainly could be better and we should always strive for better. But, um, you know, the 
the amount of algae, the, the issues we've had back in the, you know, the sixties and seventies were atrocious. Um, what I'm hearing is like 72 or so was when the clean water act really became impactful in a good way to the Chesapeake and to the Potomac and things are way better. And, and, uh, and I think trending in a positive direction, although it's a lot slower than we, we would hope for. Um, so yeah, the Clean Water Act has, has had an impact. And I would definitely tell you there's nothing I can do. I can be the smartest fishery scientist around, but if I don't have clean water and good habitat, you know, I, my hands are tied. I can't do anything. And I think perspective is so important when we talk about making gains in clear water. And, and I and I heard uh, somebody say a long time ago, like the Hudson River, w- w- the color of the Hudson River was determined by what color they were painting the trucks upriver. It was so bad back, I think it was in like the 40s and 50s. But to go from that to where we are now, it has been a huge improvement. It really has been. Yeah, when you consider the anthropogenic impacts, just the humans, the the numbers of of humans that live and recreate and use and impact places on the Chesapeake and the Hudson or wherever, all these watersheds, all these water bodies, um, they're under more and more stress just, just by the virtue of more humans, more, more terrestrial development, um, more impervious surface parking lots, whatnot, um, deforestation. Um, it, you know, you know, the challenge, to make it to make advances to to go in a positive direction, even if it's not as rapid and not as is uh, the magnitude that we would like, in the face of all the people that impact these water bodies, including the Chesapeake and Potomac, um, I think I think that does say something positive. And, and a lot of that, in what you said, does that come down just to erosion and, and what gets swept downstream from all the major tributaries to the Chesapeake? Well, I think for sure we're looking at um, we're looking at runoff, and so the runoff issues usually get categorized in two two boxes. One is nutrients, um, and, and a lot of that is agricultural. So you, you have a lot of ag, and and we certainly do have a lot in the Chesapeake, and at least the Lower Potomac. Um, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus. And again, we are making headway there. The other box is um, toxics and other contaminants. And there's a huge array of those, right? Um, and they get, they come off parking lots, atmospheric deposition. They come from all different sources, really. But when we go back to that anthropogenic impact from development, you look at places like Mattawoman Creek, a tributary on the Maryland side of the Potomac River, um, 25, 30 years ago when I was back at DNR, um, everyone was fighting hard to keep that watershed as pristine as possible and reduce developmental impacts. And, and there's been some success in trying to protect uh, that watershed from development. But we use this term impervious penetration, which is a percentage of impervious surfaces um, in a watershed that drain into that watershed. So think of parking lots, sidewalks, you know, just anything that the rain hits, it's, it's man-made, um, that takes contaminants and nutrients and, and let, allows them to get into the water. Mattawoman was one of the few watersheds in the whole Chesapeake that was less than 10% impervious surface. Hmm. Now, unfortunately, I think it's, it's, in high, it's in high teens right now. But that's a slippery slope that we're dealing with. It's really hard to protect that are, you know, use the term erosion, that is part of it. We do see sediments and other things come in as a result of that, but it's, it's a lot more than that. Um, it's, it's just these hard surfaces that aren't forest with tree litter that soak up, you know, our precipitation. And now it's all flashy, strong rain events, pulses of rainwater go down the storm drains and go right into these creeks and rivers. And, uh, you know, the impacts are pretty significant. What, what can be done about that? Or what can people at home do to help with that? It's not very sexy, but I got to tell you, I do it a lot myself is <clears throat> I try to pay attention and listen. And I try to make relationships with people that are plugged in to what's going on at a watershed level. And so, for instance, let's just use Mattawoman because it's in the Potomac and Matter Woman flows right into the Potomac, so I care a lot about it, even though it's not technically in our jurisdiction. Um, but 
I have contact with the Matter, Matter Woman Watershed Protective Society and a couple other groups. And I just got a call last week from them saying, hey, there's going to be a public hearing coming up. The Charles County uh, government is trying to look at zoning changes mm -hmm. that might allow condominiums to be built or something like that. It's not very sexy. Fishermen want to just go fishing. They want to get out on the water. Um, but ultimately, those kind of things, you know, if you tear down a bunch of trees and put up a couple hundred condominiums within a mile or two of, you know, the river you're fishing, there's going to be an impact to that. Mm -hmm. and it's not going to be positive. Um, so you want to weigh in on those, you get involved in those issues. Um, I don't know a lot of fishing groups that really spend a lot of time doing that. You almost have to connect with one of these um, conservation organizations that look at, you know, protection of land assets. Um, and so I spend a lot of time doing that. I try to build relationships. Uh, even though I'm a fisheries ecologist, I try to reach out to these um, these local governments where the planning organizations occur. You know, so St. Mary's County, Charles County, Prince George's County, and then here on the Virginia side, Westmoreland County. You know, I try to make connections with those people that are that are, that are the planners. A lot of times they don't even know, though, oh, there's a, a company that wants to build, a, you know, whatever, an auto dealership here. And they're, they've applied, you know, to rezone the land. And they may not, the planners may not even know there's going to be a potential impact to a creek or a watershed that flows ultimately mm -hmm. in Potomac and then the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so I have found when I reach out to those folks, um, they're really appreciative. And so they can at least speak to the higher ups that make those approvals, uh, which are usually the, you know, the, it's the government or county or county council or somebody like that. Um, and so when they vote on things, they can say, hey, the Potomac River Fisheries Commission weighed in. They're a little bit concerned about this development, this proposed project, because it could impact negatively spawning habitat for whatever, you know, uh, largemouth bass or something. I don't know. Um, so, so none of that is very sexy at all. And fishermen, most fishermen I talk to are like, oh, geez, I don't, I don't have any interest in doing that. But, you know, if your quality of fishing goes down, you sometimes you have to go that extra mile, right? Well, and a lot of times anglers and, you know, even commercial fishermen, they're the canary in the coal mine. Um, you know, I'm really close to the Shenandoah fiasco that happened back in the early 2000s. And I remember so many people that would be floating the river. And it's like, well, I knew that was happening, but they didn't do anything. And when there was that weird netting fiasco in, I think it was Chickamauxin earlier this year, I got like 10,000 text messages to cover it. I'm like, dude, I'm not in the water. You have an iPhone 10,000, video what's going on. Everyone has a camera in their pocket. If you see a spill or something, like it takes you five seconds to video it and send it to the proper people. You know, it's that easy. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, 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 I've always found, I mean, I spend most of my time, unfortunately, in, in offices going to meetings and uh, in my youth, I, when I was much younger, I spent a lot of time in the field as a field biologist. But oh, cool. really, I found fishermen to be one of my best assets. And fortunately, here at PRFC, we're kind of like a mom and pop shop. It's in a day and age where a lot of people get their licenses online. They never really go visit DNR or you know VWR or Enrichment or you know, Virginia Marine Resources Commission at Fort Monroe. Uh, most people just don't even have that level of interaction. And so uh, at least here we do. And so I see a lot of fishermen of all different types, commercial, recreational, charter boat, uh, guides. And I try to talk to all of them when they come in. Uh, they know that they can call me. They know if they see something unusual, they can reach out to me. And I would also encourage any of your listeners and viewers, you know, if, if they, you know, if they want to, to please, you know, call me at any time if they see something unusual. Um, you know, the mission statement for our agency is very similar to the mission statement for Maryland DNR, for uh, Virginia. All of us have basically three words, conserve, protect, improve. And, and so, then link you know, in the episode description, guys, to all the contact information that you need. So if you're out hmm. there, if you want to, if you want to be able to communicate with them, I'll link that in the episode description. Um, that would be great. Yeah. The Striper situation and and i know before we started recording we started to talk about that and so we'll, we'll backfill it uh leading up to what's happening in august what has been the situation with the striper fishing for the past like two or three years that's culminating in, in what's coming up okay so 
just for that timeline, the last two or three years, we've we've been in a decline of abundance uh, from a coastwide perspective. Um, and that's largely being driven by re- what we call recruitment, which is reproduction. So we know that over the ages, over the decades, going back as far as we have records, that dominant, what we call dominant year classes have carried this fishery. Striped bass are a species that can live a long time if, if they're not caught in, you know, by fishermen or whoever, predators. Uh, they can live multiple decades. I've aged fish that are 23, 24 years old. Wow. Um, they often don't make it that far. They just don't, yeah. uh, even though they're capable of living. Something will catch them and eat them. Um, but for a long-lived species, what you want are multiple strong year classes supporting that, like the pillars of that that fishery to make it sustainable for the long run. We also know that striped bass, like a lot of anadromous fish species that come in and from saltwater to freshwater to spawn, they have a high level of what we call interannual variability in spawning success. So despite a big robust population of adults and females, um, you've got all the breeders there you need. If the environmental conditions aren't good, you could have a bad year of reproduction, right? Um, conversely, you could have even a smaller batch of females and get perfect environmental conditions and have a great hatch. So, um, but it varies year to year and you, you just don't get a strong hatch last year, this year, next year, it just doesn't happen. It's up and down. So what's carried us over the decades, really going back as far as we have records into the fifties are these dominant year classes. So we had an incredible uh, run in the 90s. We had 93, 96, 2001, and 2005. Those year classes were all super dominant. They were the biggest ones we have on record going all the way back to 1954. As you correlate it to the Young of the Year survey, which I think a lot of your listeners are familiar with that term, that's a survey that's conducted every summer um, by Maryland and Virginia in the Chesapeake Bay. And they look at that. It, it's a very strong prognosticator of how well striped bass reproduced. And then consequently, you know, what kind of abundance are we going to have going down the line? If you get a really strong young of the year index, um, you know, in any given year, you're, you're going to have a really good fishery. Right now in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, there's a lot of people catching fish that are like 20 to 23, 24 inches. Um, everywhere you look, Fort McHenry, they're catching them up in the Baltimore Harbor right now. You look on social media. I had people email me. Can you believe this? There's like 30 charter boats up in the Baltimore Harbor fishing wow. for straight bass. Wow. But the fish are all like 20 to 24 inches. And we know that those fish were hatched almost exclusively in 2018 or 2017. Um, those were above average year classes. They weren't dominant, but they were above average. And that's what everybody's catching right now. So we we can really take that uh, young of the year survey index and determine, you know, how is that going to feed in? And we do track it over time. We don't just look at it and forget about it. There's a bunch of other surveys that supplement to see if that you get a good hatch in 2017. You know, five years later, are those fish still as strong as the signal you got from that young of the year hatch? Um, So to get back to your original question, Hmm. for the last few years, we've been in a decline and the decline has been driven by poor reproduction. So starting in 19 and 20, 21 and last year, 22, four successive poor reproduction events, four poor recruitment events. Um, And I took a look this past weekend Um, and you can find this on the Maryland DNR site. Um, I looked at the young of the year index and there's two of them up there. Most of the ones that go out to the press are what they call the arithmetic mean, which is just the numerical average. And that's the one that gets put out in the press release. Statistical folks and scientists use the geometric mean. That's always up. That's also up there on their website. I looked at the geometric mean going all the way back to 1957. And I couldn't find four consecutive years that were as bad as these, 19 to 22. That's wow. not very good. Now, in the 80s, we we were 
and we had a you know, dearth of, of reproductive events as well. And that's when the moratorium was put in place. We did have one kind of slightly better than average year class in 1982. And, and the moratorium was actually implemented to protect that year class. And I'm set telling you that because there's somewhat of an analogy with the, the actions that ASMFC took in May to protect the 2015 year class. Uh, because the 2015 year class was a strong, really strong year class. I, I wouldn't quite go so far as to call it a dominant, like a top you know, five or top 10, but it was really strong, um, more so than the 17s and the 18s. So what we've got left in our whole fishery from Maine to North Carolina, including the Chesapeake Bay, um, are essentially four year classes that are driving the whole coastal fishery, 11, mm. 15, 17, and 18. And so that's not bad news, right? That's four spread out year classes that are supporting different ages of fish. Um, but what we're seeing that's a really not so favorable signal are these four consecutive years of poor reproduction, 19, 20, 21, and 22. So there's nothing coming behind the 2018s, if that makes sense. Do you guys have any hypothesis or do you speculate on what is creating this this four to five year drop? That, that's a great question. And I, the honest answer is we don't know. Um, we know it's environmentally driven, um, but we don't know whether we're just the beneficiaries of bad luck. We just don't get we're not getting the right conditions. We know in a lot of years, if you get high flow and a very slow, gradual, incremental increase in temperature that doesn't go up and down and up and down with frontal passages, those are like the ideal conditions. And generally, you can get a good good spawn then. But um, we don't know whether it's more acute. It's just we're not quite getting the right combination of flows with precipitation, high flows, are, are good, low flows are not good. And, um, and then temperatures, oscillations up and down, um, or a really dramatic quick warming, which we had this spring, not so good. Um, you, want, you want the fish to be able of different age groups to spawn over a large window of time. The larger fish come in first, they spawn first, but you also want that to be supplemented with medium sized and smaller females, which will spawn a little bit later than the first arrivals. Um, so, so we don't know, Thomas, that it's something more acute or the other, the other driver that we're really starting to ask questions about, but we, we can't answer, we're, we're starting to investigate it, is climate change, right? That's, so yeah. we, know, we know that, that the Bay, we know that we're getting milder winters. We just don't see them as frequently as we did or as consistently as we did. Um, and we also know that the bay water temperatures, even though it doesn't seem to most people to be much, even like a half a degree to a three quarters degree centigrade is significant. Um, so one of the concerns we have that we're thinking about is what we call a zooplankton larval mismatch. So when striped bass come in to spawn, they're going to lay their eggs, and depending on the temperature of the water, um, they're going to hatch after X number of days. As things warm up, they hatch. As soon as they hatch, those larval fish uh, into the, the, you know, the first few days to the first week to 10 days, it's critical that they immediately have access to food. That food is zooplankton, little tiny animal plankton, right? And in order to have an abundant supply of animal plankton ready, there has to also be phytoplankton for the, for the zooplankton to eat. In most springs, what we think happens when we have dominant, good, successful reproductive events is we get rainfall, high flows into the watershed, which flush nutrients in. In this case, the nutrients are beneficial because the nutrients will drive phytoplankton blooms. So you get your plant plankton out in the water system, the available zooplankton react to that food source, their plant plankton source, and they explosively reproduce. Mm. So on a wet year, a high rainfall year, you get the, the phytoplankton, the nutrients, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton. So the food supply is there for the striped bass when the, when the eggs hatch, if that makes sense. 
And so you have a high level of survivorship amongst those eggs and those larval fish. In years we don't get, you know, the, the right timing or, you know, whatnot of that hatch, the food availability may not be there. You might get a great hatch. There might be ton, ten, millions and zillions of eggs out there. They all hatch and the fry are there, but they don't have enough zooplankton to feed upon. And where climate change comes in, and my last point on this would be, if we're having a warm up earlier, if our, if our winters are milder and the fish arrive and they're spawning sooner and the, the weather events, the precipitation events are happening at their normal time or even later, and there's a mismatch with the climatic events that drive the zooplankton abundance that with the spawning arrival of the fish are spawning earlier, which in fact, by the way, we think happened this year. Hmm. We'll find out in a couple of weeks when that survey starts. But if that's the case, you have basically a timing mismatch. The young fish that have newly hatched aren't synced up with the zooplankton availability, if that makes sense. And so the fish basically starve to death and they, you just don't get a good reproductive event. Um, so I don't know if that's a little bit too complex, but that's one of the things we're thinking about. It, you know, is it, is it these, is it just bad luck with his environmental conditions uh, or, you know, and maybe, maybe next year or the year after we'll get a couple of great events. I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens, but we, we are a little bit concerned about the long-term issues with climate change. It is it is a changing environment, and I feel like that argument is supported by the the anecdotal evidence that there's more speckled trout and redfish pups being caught now in the bay. And from my limited knowledge, that's more of a that's more of a North Carolina thing. And I even as a kid did not remember as many pictures of specks and reds being caught in the Chesapeake as they are now. That's a great point and good observation. And in climate change, the term we use, a couple of terms, one is adaptation. So for folks that are in a job like me, we can't really change things. Um, we can only adapt our management philosophies and styles. So we've also noted that with climate change, there's going to be winners and losers. So you just mentioned a couple of winners, the cyanids, the drum family. So speckled trout, and um, red drum. Um, again, the species typically, I mean, we're kind of on that northern range. We have been through at least my time. Um, but in recent years, probably the last 10 years, maybe a little bit more, um, because of these mild winters, um, these fish that are a little bit sensitive to cooler water, they see this warmer water, they, they see good habitat, they see favorable water temperatures, and they're taking advantage of it. So the red drummer in here, as you noted, and so are the speckled trout. So they are winners. The losers are summer flounder. When I was hmm. a young biologist back in the 80s and early 90s, I used to go out every fall with the Hooper Island pound netters on fishery surveys, and we would see tens of thousands of pounds of doormat flounders over wow. by the Hooper Islands. And I went out fishing with a fellow named Pete Dressler, who's long gone, and probably the best flounder fisherman I've ever seen. He took me out to the False Channel. I want to say that was like in 1997. And between the two of us in about three and a half hours, we caught close to 200 flounder at the, at the Falls Channel. You don't see them anymore. They Summer flounder do not like Chesapeake temperatures in the summertime. We still see little ones. It's still a nursery area for age zeros, the young fish. But once they get to one year, two years of age, they want out of the Chesapeake. It's too warm too formidable for them from a temperature perspective. And so they're moving north and they're moving further offshore. And so New Jer northern New Jersey, New York, uh, they're all the beneficiaries of, of climate change for summer flounder. And you probably heard of shrimp. Virginia developed a sh white shrimp fishery uh, just off the capes. And it's a little bit ephemeral. One year it may be okay. The next year it might be lights out. But you know, that's a fairly new phenomenon for these white shrimp that moved up. And I, I talked to folks up in the York Rappahannock Rivers. They catch shrimp. I think hmm. a couple of people came in my office. They were in the lower part of the Potomac um, down near Kinsale. And they said they they had a dip net and they caught a bunch of white shrimp right off their docks. So that's crazy. You don't we just don't know what's happening, it, it, but it's definitely changing. And there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. So in theory, if this continues, then the stripers main habitat would scoot north to like Nova Scotia and like the Bay of St. Lawrence then would be at the upper end. 
That, another fantastic question. You're an excellent interviewer. Um, yeah, so the that's that's a question we can't answer either, right? So we know that just by a, a number of different metrics that the Chesapeake typically produces somewhere around 75% of the coastal population of striped bass. That's We're called a production area. Other production areas, as you probably clearly know, are the Delaware Bay and the Hudson River. Um, Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds, we now think, have a, a, a population of striped bass. It's also a producer area, but we think the stripers that are spawned down in Albemarle and Pamlico have geographic fidelity to hmm. North Carolina. Um, so the coastal population that we're all so used to, that your listeners are used to, spawn in the Chesapeake Bay, migrate out when they're four, five, six years old, join the coastal migrants, summer up off of New England, come back down. It used to be off North Carolina because of climate change, because of the factors you just said. We now see most of the wintering fish right off Cape Charles and Cape Henry, much to the north of that. Wow. And this past winter, we saw a bunch of those fish all the way up by Cape May. That's the furthest north we've ever seen them in January. That's crazy. So I think your, your assessment is somewhat accurate. We're seeing a shift in where they are spending their time in both the winter and the summer. I think the big question mark is, are we going to lose the Chesapeake Bay as, the, as a primary dominant production area? And if we do lose the Chesapeake over the next decade or two, remember, we had four, we've had four bad years of reproduction. All eyes are on that survey that starts the week after 4th of July, not next week, but the following week. So if we get a fifth bad year, I don't know exactly what that means, but that'll be unprecedented. And I guess the question is, if we lose the Chesapeake as a primary production area for striped bass, can the other production areas like the Delaware Bay and the Hudson take up the slack? Wow. And most people I pose that question to are dubious. They don't believe it can. Not at the population levels that the fishery has really demanded. There's so many people that fish for striped bass all up and down the coast from Maine all the way down to North Carolina. And they want an abundance of fish. And if we lose the Chesapeake as a production area, I'm not saying we we will, but I think we're starting to ask that question, is this longer term climate change going to really impact the productivity of the Chesapeake as a spawning area for striped bass? We don't know really know what the, the outcome of that's going to be. And then ballpark, when will you get the data back on that survey? So they do three rounds and um, they're conducted in July, August and September. The analysis takes a few weeks um, and they'll typically Maryland, Virginia will put out their press releases. Uh, I'm going to say early October, they'll put them out. Okay. Um, the word sometimes leaks out on the street. Um, everyone knows the conditions this year are abysmal. Um, it doesn't mean you couldn't get a good year class. I was just having lunch with a fellow named Joe Boone, um, who's 90 years old. And he was on the first surveys in the, in the 50s. He's still alive. He was a Maryland Tidewater Fisheries, fisheries biologist. And uh, he's still very active and you know, alive and kicking and doing great. And he's, he's a storehouse of knowledge. And he, he and I spoke for a few hours about all this stuff. And what's really interesting, Thomas, is, you know, you could have what looks like phenomenal conditions. Everything looks perfect, right? And all of a sudden you get a terrible reproductive event. Conversely, you could have really abysmal conditions like we did this spring. We had a drought. We had really low flows, matching like 90 year records. So we had low inflow and we had a really rapid temperature rise. Um, we didn't have ups and downs, which was good, but it went through striped bass spawn typically about 85 to 90 percent of striped bass have finished spawning by the time you get to 20 degrees centigrade. Hmm. Um, most of the spawning occurs between 12 and 16. So, so we had a really rapid run through the 12 to 16. We were done that in like early April. Hmm. You know, I said, when I told that to Joe, his reaction was, my God, because the fish usually don't even start showing up until then. So if you're following me, Joe's mm -hmm. reaction when he was doing the survey back when I was two years old, 
I, you know, I'm 63, by the way. It tells you how long. So he was, he was doing the survey back then. What he was saying was the fish didn't even show up. And this year, the fish finished spawning before they even showed up at Joe's time. So you can see this climate thing is really, hmm. it's, it's real. And, um, you know, the problem is when you lose people like Joe, you know, it's called the shifting baseline. What you and your cohorts will experience compared to me is going to be totally different. And when you're my age and you're trying to tell the same stories I'm telling, um, you're going to be talking to a whole younger cohort that has their own baseline, what they think is normal, what they think is correct. And, and so it's really important to kind of be able to you know, to keep in touch with that history, I think, to understand oh, things fully. A hundred percent, because it's a moving goalpost at that point if you don't anchor yourself in the history of, of what's come before you. Um, and, and guys, again, you know, when, when that information comes out, I'll definitely be covering that. How does, how does all, all the changes in the Bay coincide with the, with the oysters and the crab situation? Yeah, again, it's like winners and losers, right, with all these dynamics. Um, so with oysters, um, we thought we were in a really bad place back in 2019. And the reason was what we, we had was a major freshet that occurred. Um, it started in, in April of 2018 and went through July of 2019. And freshet is just a term for a lot of inundation of precipitation. And it wasn't um, like one or two storms. What, what happened during that time frame from April of 18 through July of 19 is we had a succession of really um, significant uh, storms, many of which lasted a long time. Um, these weren't tropical cyclones, but like we, in the course of, you know, 10 days, two weeks, you'd have four or five storms and there's just a lot of precipitation. What happened, Thomas, during that time period, for, and this is bad for oysters, was the salinity dropped extremely low. So, for mm. instance, in the Potomac River, we lost, we had like 80 to 85 percent mortality of, of the oysters we had left here. Maryland um, had similar issues and they lost a lot of their oysters. So coming out of that freshet, which ended in July of 19, we all thought Maryland and Potomac was in a really bad place for oysters. And it was going to take a long time to get back to a, to a better place. And, and what happened was, which was remarkable was there was a micro drought that occurred in August and September of 19. And the, and the salinities went from like zero, one, two, three, four parts per thousand. Anything less than five will kill an oyster. Hmm. And they went back up above, above average. Higher salinities, oysters thrive. So in Virginia, they never have problems because they have pretty consistent salinities down the lower part of the Chesapeake. Um, and, and their oysters don't, they don't have oyster mortalities due to fresh water, uh, things like that. But, but since we came out of that freshet, salinities have generally been up. We had another dry spring, as we've already discussed. So that's been good for oysters. Hmm. Um, and we've had good reproduction here in the Potomac. We've had good reproduction in Maryland. And you see the harvest have come up. So when we had good reproduction in 1920, a couple of years go by, those oysters mature. You see the harvest go up. Um, so there's so environmental conditions have been beneficial over the last couple of years for oysters. Fortunately, with higher salinities or unfortunately, you can get um, higher disease impacts from two pathogens, MSX and Dermo. The good news is um, the leading researcher in the Chesapeake Bay is a fellow named Ryan Carnegie from VIMS. And he thinks over the last quarter century, oysters have become much more tolerant of those two pathogens to the point where the mortalities, even when we have high salinities, Makes don't sense. really kill them as much. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the end game on oysters is the last couple of years have been favorable for them. Um, and then you asked about crabs. Um, crabs have been really, really um, tricky for us. Uh, again, it's an animal that only lives like three years. Hmm. It's, cap it's capable of living six or seven years. But <laughs> like I was telling you the story on rockfish, with crabs, it's even worse because here's an animal that can live six, seven years, but everything wants to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> including themselves. They will eat, they will cannibalize themselves. So 
everything wants to eat a crab and, and they, they rarely make it longer than three. If you get a four year old crab, you've, you've got a, a true elder statesman or stealth stateswoman. Um, but they do generally don't even make it to four. So you're, you're dealing with like a crop, right? So you're really relying on a good reproduction, sort of like we are with striped bass, but it's a short lived animal relative to related to striped bass, which is a long lived animal. Uh, striped bass live 30 years in theory. Um, with crabs, again, if you make it to four, it's almost a miracle. So you're really reliant on good reproduction and it goes up and down like striped bass. So you could have good reproduction with crabs one year and not so great with crabs the next year. And so um, with crabs, we had a couple bad years of reproduction, like 2021 and even 22 were not that good. And we have our own survey to, uh, to assess that as well. And it's generally been pretty accurate, but now we're starting to wonder with a warming bay, whether or not our winter survey, that's when we conduct our crab survey. It's called the winter dredge survey when the crabs are buried and essentially sessile. So we can, we can kind of get a census of them because they're sitting still. But now we're wondering whether or not we're missing some of these young crabs hmm. because the, the, the winter temperatures are not as cold as they've been, right? It could be that they're just warm enough that the smaller crabs can move around enough to evade our gear. So we may not be getting an accurate signal uh, from our survey on what's happening, particularly with the youngest crabs. But the end snapshot information for your listeners would be so crabs had been in a good place from about 2011 to about 20. Uh, 17 or 18, we, relatively stable, getting better and better. And then we had some some weak recruitment, some weak re reproductive events. Um, we got a little bit concerned about that. We had two years of harvest that weren't so good. That would have been 2020 and 2021. And then last year we were bracing for potentially a really bad year, but that thing surprised us. And the watermen did pretty well, particularly in August, September and October. Hmm. Even though our harvests were below average, they came up significantly. So the science there, it, these surveys aren't perfect. Um, they generally give us a pretty good indication, but <clears throat> at least on, in this case, the survey from not this past winter, but the previous winter was indicating not good things, but the watermen proved differently. They, they caught more crabs. So I was kind of relieved that we were wrong there, at least the survey was wrong. But crabs are, are, are in an okay place, um, but we're hoping to get them in a better place. And, and when you say watermen, just for the people at home, and you talked about how you collect the, uh, the young of the year, uh, is that the only way that you're doing it is going out in the winter and collecting it? Or are you even anecdotally getting data from commercial fishermen and their harvest? Well, we, just to be clear, are we talking about striped bass? Uh, crabs. Oh, so, so with crabs, there's there's several surveys going on. The one that the public hears the most about is the winter dredge survey, which is done independent. It's not it's not really part of watermen help with the survey. They own the boats. Gotcha. So okay. But the gear that we use is standardized. It's a dredge with certain mesh diameter. Um, all the gear is 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 pretty tightly standardized. Um, even despite that, we see some issues we have to constantly tweak and tinker with to make sure that we're getting a, a, a um, how do I want to call it, a, a uniform you know, sample. When we sample, we want to make sure we're doing it the same every time, right? So, um, so we do contract watermen to conduct the survey, but the gear is all, it's not, it's not from their catch, for instance. Mm. So the winter time survey goes to 1,500 sites uh, in December, January, and February. Um, and that's done in both Maryland, Virginia, and in the Potomac. Uh, Maryland does the, the Potomac survey for us because we don't we're not big enough. We don't have our own boats and crew and all that stuff. Um, so they go out during that time. That's the one that everybody's aware of. But there are other surveys that go on that both Maryland and Virginia do at other times of the year that act as sort of a check. And so there's some trawl surveys that are done by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, for instance, that do the whole Chesapeake Bay during the summer months. And so if we get a really weak signal from that winter survey or conversely, a strong signal that that summer troll survey should still see those crabs. Right. It, it just did a little bit further out in time. 
So we have these other surveys that occur that both Maryland and Virginia has different surveys to sample crabs during the summer and the fall. Um, so there's really data being collected. I, I, I don't know if I would say year round, but seasonally for sure. And so we're looking for consistency. Does that winter s survey uh, that told us this, is it, is it still being, is the message still the same in these other surveys? They sort of corroborate you know, that, that winter, that dominant winter survey. And this is almost, this is a great tie-in too. So it sounds like the, the, the blue crab population is, is hanging in there. And that's interesting because you have the other hot topic, which is the blue cats. And a lot of times if you hear the doc talk, it's how the blue cats have already decimated everything and there's nothing left alive. And I would love to hear your opinion on that, where they stand and are they having a negative impact or is it just not shown up yet in the data points? Well, they're they're having a negative impact for sure. But, you know how we quantify that's going to be really challenging for a couple of reasons. First one is we don't really have a baywide assessment of how many blue catfish there are, and then even more so, each population in each tributary um, is different. So the population in the James is not like the population in the Potomac is not like the population in the chop tank or the chester so on and so on and so on those sub estuaries those those rivers those tributaries all have their own kind of unique uh, habitats and these catfish um, are using these systems and you know differently and um, in the york i'm sorry in, in the james for instance where they were first introduced um, back i guess in the early 70s you know, I think most people know the history there. That fishery started out slow, um, but, you know, they brought them in as a, as a game fish. And over the course of a couple of decades, the population increased. And then there were these huge trophy fish that everybody really coveted, you know, the sport fishermen. Um, but then the population exploded. And so what's down there mostly now, you still have a few really large fish, but for the most part, they have a huge biomass of these smaller catfish that cap out at like four pounds. They're, they're small fish, um, but there's oodles and oodles of them. The biomass is staggering. And the percent composition relative to all fish species of blue cats is also a mind boggling number. I, I've heard different figures, but it's somewhere in the order of like 80 to 90% of all fish are blue catfish. So, so the, the James, I guess the, the lesson there is that's where they started. And the population for the first couple of decades um, was way different than what we see right now with these smaller fish. But if you compare that to other systems like the York and the Rappahannock, they're not comparable either. The, the populations in the York, a little more diverse age-wise and size-wise, same in the Rappahannock. When you get to the Potomac, it's a whole nother ball game. Uh, anybody that spent time on the Potomac, either as a commercial fisherman or just out recreationally fishing, knows you catch all sizes, some really, really big fish. And sometimes it has to be certain times of the year in certain places. But we have a broad array of sizes hmm. and age fish, and it's nothing like what we're seeing in the James. And the only thing we can think of when we sit at our meetings and discuss this is, you know, the energy levels in the, in the different rivers based on the forage availability for these fish are different. The Potomac has an incredible abundance of gizzard shad and other, other fish species that these fish like to eat. Um, but they're impacting game fish too. We, we know that for a fact. They're eating crabs. Uh, a study came out of VIMS, the first one, directly um, assessing the impact of blue catfish on blue crabs. And it was the, the information that came out of that survey that was published in December of last year was pretty profound. So we know that they're, you know, they're opportunistic feeders and they'll get whatever they can fit into their mouth, basically. It's, it's gape size for the mouth that determines what they're going to eat. They're pretty indiscriminate about it. Um, but they do, when they hit about 20 to 22 inches, they go through what's called an ontogenetic shift, um, which essentially means they're, it's a fancy term for their switching from an omnivorous diet, eating plants, whatever, worms, anything, small fish, frogs, 
to primarily fish, not exclusively maybe, but primarily fish. So once they're in the low 20s, that's what they want. They want fish. And in the Potomac, they've got an abundance of gizzard shad and other fish that they can eat. Maybe not so much in the James. Maybe that's why you've got a bunch of smaller fish there. We don't know about the Chester, the Chop Tank, uh, hmm. you know, whatever. We, they're all just different. So I think, you know, for us to be able to gauge the impact, it's really difficult. We want to, but we just can't, we can't get there. Not yet anyway. Is it also, a? I, I mean, I, I don't know when they were first seen in the Potomac, but if it was, if it was the seventies and the James, you're talking between 40 to 50 years, they've been in there to hit where they are now, assuming that the Potomac and these other rivers didn't get them immediately. Then is that something where maybe the James is where the Potomac will end up? Or is that just factors that we can't assess at this point? Yeah, I think it's the latter. We, we don't know. Um, I've wondered that myself because <clears throat> uh, nobody really could have foreseen what's what we're seeing now in the James, because <clears throat> the unfortunate part about having a lot of two or three pound fishes, um, if, if you, you know, we want to commercially, we want to remove as many of these fish as we can, at least the folks that sit in my shoes, mm -hmm. or there's sport fishermen that there's some sport fishermen that feel differently. But, um, you know, we, it's, it's a non-native species. It is truly invasive. It is ecologically destructive. It's not like some species that have become naturalized. We have a lot of non-native fish in the Chesapeake watershed. Um, in the Potomac alone, you can walleyes, a couple of species of trout. I mean, it just goes on and on. Both species of black bass, smallmouth and largemouth are non-indigenous to the Chesapeake. But the difference is they become naturalized. They're not changing trophic dynamics. They're not changing the food web of the food chain. Um, it, Blue catfish have incredible potential to do damage ecologically. Hmm. Um, they're different. They're truly invasive. So the good news is they're they're extremely uh, they're they're great to eat. They're they're nutritious. They're relatively free of contaminants. In fact, if you compare a twenty five to thirty inch blue catfish with a striped bass, it's way cleaner. It's in terms of contaminants both. PCBs and methylmercury. Hmm. It, and that's partly because the fish grows so fast, it's still a young animal. It hasn't accumulated any of that. The issue we have with blue cats is once they get to about a meter long, then you're starting to see elevated contaminants. And then that's when the, that's when the um, fish consumption advisories start to kick in. Um, but we can make lemonade out of these lemons, right? Um, because they are edible and they're really good to eat. I mean, I went to a Southern school and all we ate are catfish down there, but they were farmed out of ponds. But every restaurant served catfish and there's catfish fries everywhere. And I think we have, I would hope one of the things that develops in the fishing community and the, and the population of our region at large is that we embrace this invasive species and just, I'm not going to say it's going to replace culturally our crab feast. I certainly wouldn't want that to happen, but you know, I, I would hope fish fries become more of a commonplace thing. And every restaurant should be featuring these things on their menu. Mm. You should not be able to walk in to any restaurant and, and be able to buy local blue catfish. Um, it, it's so easy to prepare. It, it's so good. It doesn't have a strong taste to it. Um, and, and we just have a long way to go to get public acceptance to eat this fish. Um, but anybody that's tried it probably knows what I'm talking about. It's, it's really fine. It's great to eat. How many pounds have to be removed per year to where you will see a positive impact on the ecological you know, basis of these places? I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, we, we, we're still trying to get our heads wrapped around, you know, what is the population assessment of this species? Wow. And, we, we just don't know. I mean, we're still trying to figure out it, it's expanding still. This, mm -hmm. this is a, it, you know, that freshette that I talked about a while back, you know, that allowed for them. That was the Pandora's box. They were up trapped up in these rivers and the populate. We saw it firsthand in the Potomac. Um, that freshette I told you earlier that started in April of 18. By August of 18, the salinities dropped to zero. These fish, and I think you probably know this, but ocean water salinity for reference, 
if you're out in the ocean, it's 18, I'm sorry, it's 35 parts per thousand. So um, average for the lower Potomac at Point Lookout is somewhere around 17 to 20. Um, 18 is the wall for them. We used to think it was 12. They may be adapting. I don't think they can adapt. That's crazy. Anything. Uh, right. 15 to 20 years ago, we thought 12 parts per thousand salinity was a wall. They could not go through. Now we're seeing those fish 16, 17, 18 parts. We, they, now the 18 seems to be the wall. And I don't think physiologically they can get past that. But my point is, if the mouth of the Potomac on average in August is 17 to 20 parts per thousand, that's, that's at the wall. The fish can't go any further. They can't get into the main bay, right? But in August of 2018, because of that freshet and all that fresh mm. water, the salinity dropped down at Point Lookout to like three or four or five. The gates opened. The gates opened. Pandora's box is open. Those fish came down. Our pound netters had never caught them down below St. Uh, it was uh, St. Clement's Island. They had never caught them down there. Or if they did, it was a couple that somehow got up in Breton Bay or whatever and came down. They were catching six, 8,000 pounds a day. Those sure. fish came down. They came down like a gold rush. And they went out into the main Chesapeake. So flash forward from August of 2018, when I heard our pound netters telling me, Marty, they've come clear down the river. They're all the way down here near the mouth of the river. I get a call from a guy who you may be familiar with, who your listeners are, Pete Dalberg. They call him Walleye Pete. Uh, I've known Pete since the late 90s um, when you know I wrote about when I was at DNR, the Calvert Cliffs discharge. Uh, when I was at DNR, I wrote a big article on that, and a lot of people started fishing there in the winter. Anyway, Pete's been fishing the discharge at Calvert Cliffs since the late 90s. And he fishes there for staging stripers, you know, before they move into the rivers to spawn. And one day he text messaged me and he showed me a bunch of these huge blue catfish. These fish were over 30 inches long and he's jigging them up at the discharge pipe off Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant. Wow. They've never, never seen them there before. And the reason he's seeing them is because the salinity is down below five parts per thousand at the off Calvert Cliffs. So anyway, hmm. Pandora's box gets open, the fish go everywhere. And since that happened, they have been colonizing these rivers all over Maryland's part of the bay. So they're in every river right now. And in some rivers which have refugia and droughts, like we're having a drought right now. So all these animals have moved up into the rivers as far as they can go. Even in the Potomac, all of our commercial guys are working up above Marshall Hall right now. Not to say you couldn't catch them further down, but that's where most of them are. And that's because it's been so dry and the salinity wedge is up the river a little bit. So I guess what I'm trying to say, Thomas, is the, you know, can we figure out when we're making an impact to it? We can do it maybe generally so. We can look at a substantial commercial fishery that's emerged and we can look at things like catch per unit of effort over time and see if we're impacting them that way. But from a population level perspective, I don't think we're really gonna know that for a long time. And then plus, if, if the bay is warming due to climate change, I'm assuming that's actually gonna be a negative effect where you know this catfish population is gonna boom even more. I think you're right, um, 100%, because the other beneficiary of a warming bay is primary productivity. That's gonna magnify the other elements of the food web, which enhance the forage base for the blue cats. You know, some of these planktivorous fish like gizzard chad, they'll love that. You know, they'll, they will just have more gizzard chad. The irony there is they're native. <laughs> they're, even though nobody really cares for them, they smell it. They're, you know, but they're, they're important from a forage perspective and they are a native species. But I think you're right. Primary productivity in a warming bay will benefit blue catfish. This is, this is great stuff. And again, guys, link in the episode description, uh, to everything we talked about today. Um, I mean, I mean, the, the last thing I really wanted to hit on was, you know, the SAV situation in the Potomac. I mean, this is definitely really hits home to a lot of the bass anglers that listen to me right now. And, and, and one thing I've always wanted to know is it, it, a chicken or the egg, I guess, issue here. Is it, you need better water quality for the SAV to take root or is it, you need SAV for the water quality to become better? 
Oh boy, I don't know if it's a chicken or egg because I think you need both. Okay. And when you have when you have a lot of nutrients in the water, nitrogen, phosphorus, a lot of it from anthropogenic sources, so sewage treatment plants, fertilizer coming off uh, both farms and also coming off um, suburban developments, um, you know those nutrients are fueling um, phytoplankton. The same phytoplankton, which which is important in that earlier discussion uh, for that springtime spawning, you, it, too much is a good thing. Too much of a good thing is not so good, right? It's, so in this case, that stuff gets so dense, it blocks out, it blocks out sunlight for these rooted plants that you're talking about, these SAVs. And so for us, you know, it used to be eelgrass mm -hmm. in a lot of places, um, along with some other species. Um, and so I guess a couple of things to get to your point, chicken, egg, I think it's both. I think if we, eat, so we have a nutrient issue we're trying, been trying for decades to work on. It. Let's say we're successful over the next 10, 15, 20 years, and we really knock down those nutrients. What you're gonna see is an opportunity for sunlight penetration because you won't have those fixed nutrients in the water that the phytoplankton will just bloom and block out all the light for the SAVs, so that would be good, right? But the other thing that, that's not related to the nutrients is the warming bay. And so the problem there is eelgrass, which at one time was a very dominant grass in, in some parts of the bay, and I think parts of the lower Potomac uh, and parts of Maryland, um, you can't really find it. And, and the SAV experts that I know and I interact with in habitat committees, what they tell me is, we're too warm for it. It's, 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 nobody wants to throw in the towel, but eelgrass, most people are skeptical, most of the experts are skeptical that we're going to get it. What we're probably going to see is, fortunately, there's a species of native grass called widgeon grass. And in the Potomac, I'm willing to bet you, apart from hydrilla, which every, of course, most of your listeners, probably you yourself, have seen a lot of, it's a non native species. Uh, it's ephemeral. It's around in the warmer times and it dies off and it comes back. Um, it hasn't proven to be, you know, terribly neg neg um, harmful. But um, what you really want are these native grasses. Our best bet appears to be widgeon grass. The problem with widgeon grass is we don't really know exactly why, but in some years, water quality, just climatic conditions become favorable and it explodes but it could be for a few months and then it just dies off. If you look at the data at the Susquehanna Flats, and if any of your readers have mm -hmm. gone up there or you've gone up there yourself, it's pretty amazing. It looks like uh, an undersea jungle up there, right? Yeah. Over 10,000 acres of, of uh, SAVs up there. A lot of that's widgeon grass. And hmm. But the problem with the widgeon grass is, again, it's ephemeral. So, so one year you could really explode and then the next year it'll really drop back. It's just, it's just highly variable. So like the flats, I don't know what percent composition is widgeon, but you know, you might be up to 12,000 acres and the next year it drops back to 8,400 acres or 8,000, whatever. I mean, it drops back significantly. And, and that's probably because the widgeon grass is highly variable. You just, for whatever reason, it wasn't growing well that year. In a perfect world, you want to restore these SAVs. You'd have a species that would take root, and you'd have this, you know, this this abundance of grasses that was pretty stable in terms of acreage and and density, etc. Um, yeah, so SAVs are a really tedious beast to kind of get uh, again your your arms wrapped around. Um, but you know, the overall story for the Potomac, at least has been somewhat good because our habitat here throughout most of the river is favorable for widgeon grass. And then some of these species um, that are not native, um, you know, and there's Eurasian milfoil and things like that, that also kind of fill in the gaps. They can prosper here in the Potomac between hydrilla, Eurasian milfoil and, and widgeon grass. Most of our, most of our stretch of the Potomac um, can, can do pretty well. So if we can get those nutrients down over the next 10, 15 years, then, then I, I think what you're going to see in the Potomac is a, is a dramatically different and dramatically better 
uh, habitat for fish and for you know and, and a better experience for fishermen that use that habitat to fish on. In the early 2000s, uh, specifically the upper portion of the river near D.C., it used to be a carpet with with how much abundance of, of SAV there was. And then whether it's due to runoff, construction of the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, whatever it was, it's it seemed like there was a major pullback of aquatic vegetation. Uh, it's drastically, it seems like it's changed over the last 10 years. It, is there any ideas? Is it just nutrition that caused that? Yeah, again, that's that's going to be one, Thomas. I don't know the answer to. Um, I was involved with the reefing of the old Woodrow Wilson Bridge, and I remember talking to the environmental engineers up there because we were moving that old bridge material when it was being torn down to build artificial reefs out in Maryland's part of the Chesapeake Bay, and there was one also built in the Lower Potomac. But I remember talking to the environmental engineer and they were trying to do everything humanly possible to minimize the impacts to those SAV beds you were referring to because everybody was talking about them, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said, they were carpeting everywhere. And it was like, it was apparently the habitat was phenomenal and it all of a sudden died off. And then there was this whole correlation equals causation. You know, was it the bridge? What caused it? And you just asked the same question, right? So I don't know the exact answer. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I'm going to be going out with that same environmental engineer. Oh, cool. He's helping us out with a nice bridge, which we're also reefing in the lower part of our river. I'm going to be going out with him tomorrow. They're going to blow up the last section of the superstructure of the nice bridge, the big metal part, at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Hmm. So I'm going to go out. I'm going to ask him that question. So I'll email you. So yeah. <laughs> you don't have the answer now, but he might. He might have heard. He may have heard the answer to your question himself. But I remember him saying, we did everything possible to kind of not impact that. And everybody blamed us, and, but nobody knows for sure whether it was the bridge construction or some other impact. But apparently a lot of that, those grasses up in DC were lost, I think. It's just, it's so fickly. You know, I even had Odenkirk, John Odenkirk on from the uh, Virginia DWR mm -hmm. and talked to him about subaquatic vegetation. And it's just, it's interesting that even in 2023, it is such a fickly thing to be able to control and try to help grow when in places that we need it. And that's just fascinating that it's still such a, such a hard nut to crack. It is. I'm, I'm glad I have fish to study. I'm not a SAV. <laughs> yeah. <person. laughs> it must be really disheartening to see, you know, when you see a success story like that, and then all of a sudden it just kind of disappears and you can't even explain why. Um, you know, we, we have same struggles with fish and oysters and all, and sometimes things happen that surprise you. But generally, we, you know, we have other data we can track and kind of come up with some sort of hypothesis when, why something's happening, um, what's causing it. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, the SAV is important, though, because it goes, again, it goes back at the beginning of our conversation. We don't have water quality and we don't have habitat, then yep. we don't have, we're, we're pretty much lost souls. Yep. It's, it's the number one thing. Um, again, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess the last thing to make sure that we reiterate this again, it's in August is the big hearing, correct? For the striper. Yeah. So for your listeners that are passionate about striped bass, a lot of folks are, um, we're coming up on a pretty important time uh, for discussions on how we're going to manage striped bass going into the future. Um, we talked a little bit about these weak year classes, we're waiting to see what this year's survey tells us. Um, and that, that is going to impact next year's decision-making. But we have teed up for discussion the first week of August at ASMFC. Those meetings are virtual, and I'm sure you can send the links to folks and they can weigh in um, and, and listen in and comment even. We usually take some public comment. Uh, but we're going to have these discussions. We're going to tee up an addendum which to our fishery management plan, which basically is a fancy way of saying it's the plan for what we're going to do in 2024. We've already decided what we're going to do this year. We're stuck to it. We did an emergency action. So the real question is, what do we do in 2024? So we have some new information that's going to be brought out at that meeting that's going to help inform uh, the board members, which I'm a member of, to discuss. Um, but we want the public's feedback. Um, we can have that public feedback at that meeting, but I think the bigger value will be after the meeting, we're likely to release a public document. It will go out for about six weeks and there'll be public hearings. The public hearings will be hybrid in all likeliness. Hmm. So 
My agency, PRFC and Colonial Beach will have one. Maryland DNR will have one or two, probably one in Annapolis, one in Ocean City. But any of these meetings are hybrid and you can you can just jump on your computer and jump in and they will allow enough time for every single person who wants to make a comment or ask a question as a question period and a comment period to weigh in on how we're going to approach 2024 management. What should we do? Um, so I would just encourage anybody that's passionate about striped bass in your listening audience um, to try to listen in so they're, they understand what we're doing in August. But then after that, you're going to hear about all these public hearings, which are likely late August into September. Then our board will reconvene at their annual meeting in mid-October. And based on all that public comment that we get in those hearings, we're then going to make a decision for 2024 what we're going to do. Thank you so much for the work that you guys do just to try to help with with not not only the Potomac River, but just the Chesapeake Bay watershed in general. And again, guys, you know, you have to get involved. Link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Um, you know, everyone wants to complain at the dock. No one wants to be the one that steps up. But if we all step up, we can start pulling the rope in the right direction. Marty, thanks again so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Now, thank you, Thomas. And thanks to all your viewers for your time and appreciate it. I'm, uh, I'm an email away if anybody has any questions. Again, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. You can watch us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, or iHeartRadio. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.